Thank you for joining us today. I'm Stephen Horsford. I represent Nevada's 4th Congressional District and serve as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Since the 118th Congress was sworn in seven, seven months ago, the Congressional Black Caucus has been fighting for the people. We have been fighting to preserve our democracy for the people, fighting to protect voting rights and creating fair districts, fighting for public safety and police accountability, fighting to protect a woman's right to choose, fighting against the expulsion of black elected officials, fighting archaic traditions that block progress, and of course, fighting extremist Republicans and a judiciary who would rather erase us, who want to see us less free and with fewer fundamental rights. I asked one of my Republican colleagues on the floor recently, what are you so afraid of? Is it the fact that shifting racial demographics are eroding the supremacy some believe they have? When they use the word woke, do you really mean black? Let me be clear. The attacks against black people and blackness are coordinated, well-funded, coming from every side, and they are about race. As we head in to the August district work period, we're at an infle inflection point in this fight. And we need to be clear about who we are up against and what we must do to win. We have to win because there is so much at stake for the people. We were reminded of these stakes just this week. The Congressional Black Caucus had the solemn horror of joining the President and Vice President at the White House on a day that should have been Emmett Till's 85th birthday. A reminder of the sad moment in our history when his mother, Mamie Till Mobley, chose to have an open casket for his funeral so that the world could see the brutalness of his murder. Their story is a reminder of the horrors of our nation's past. That's why we are still fighting the vestiges of an era that many thought had passed, but are still with us today. These remnants of a bygone era are still with us because in many ways, we have never truly dealt with the systems that enable this oppression. Our democracy works best when the institutions we depend on from our schools to the courts, and yes, the system of voting are equitable, fair, and strong. But our institutions can't serve the people when lawmakers are beholden to interests that want to privatize our schools and inundate students with misinformation about our history. Our institutions can't serve the people when extremists pack the federal judiciary with judges who are hell-bent on taking away our freedoms and suppressing our votes. And our institutions can't serve the people when even our friends hold back progress by holding on to relics of the past, like the blue slip and the filibuster. But this is what they want, to hold us back. Right now, the current governor of Florida and Republican presidential candidate and the Florida Board of Education want to ban black history books and gaslight us into believing that slavery was just a work skills program. A notion so ridiculous and incendiary that it insults every sensible American. Right now, in absolute defiance of the US Supreme Court decision that requires Alabama and Louisiana to give black voters more voting power, the Republican-controlled legislatures said no. Right now, black women are suffering because the ideologically driven Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, which is only worsening the black maternal mortality crisis. The Supreme Court has undone 50 years of precedent, allowing black and other marginalized students a better shot at attending our nation's top institutions. And to be clear, it won't stop in our institutions of higher education because now extreme MAGA Republicans are coming for diversity in the workplace. Just yesterday, 
I represented the Congressional Black Caucus at the Pentagon for the 75th anniversary of President Truman's signing of the executive order to end racial segregation in the military. I reflected as I gave thanks to the heroes in attendance, including those Tuskegee Airmen and the Monford Point Marines. What must they feel? What must they think that in the year 2023, a member of the House of Representatives took to the floor and referred to black servicemen, service women, veterans, and their families. Those who defend our country now and who have served in the past in a segregate, segregated military with their lives as, quote, colored people. While another member in the Senate hedged on whether or not white supremacists are racist. We are under attack. Black people are under attack in America. But we are not victims and we are not powerless. This is the fight before us. Our fundamental rights are under assault and our very history is being denied. But we will not stand by quietly as it happens. We will never give up when so many people are counting on us to fight for them. And I wanna thank my colleagues for being here to speak their truth about what we as the Congressional Black Caucus are doing in this moment to defend our democracy and to protect our race. Representative Terry Sewell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Congresswoman Sewell and I proudly represent Alabama's seventh congressional district, which includes the historical cities of Birmingham, Montgomery, Tuscaloosa, and my hometown of Selma, Alabama. Just last month, black voters in my home state of Alabama won a historic victory when the Supreme Court ordered the state to redraw its congressional map to create at least two majority minority districts or something quite close. After all, black voters represent 27% of the voting age population in Alabama. Yet under the current map, Black voters get a say in electing a candidate of their choice in only one of our state's seven congressional districts. In issuing its decision, the Supreme Court said loudly and clearly that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is indeed alive and enforceable. Their decision would have ensured that African Americans in Alabama, black <coughs> voters, are fully and fairly represented in Congress. However, last week, the state of Alabama shamelessly chose to ignore the Supreme Court's decision, and they're in it. The map advanced by the state legislature includes only one majority minority district and a second district where black voters in Alabama make up only 39% of the voting population. That's not two majority minority district or something close to it. Let me be clear. This map does not apply nor <clears throat> this map does not comply with the Supreme Court's order and is an insult to black voters across this nation. I fully expect that it will be rejected by the courts. At a time when many are trying to erase our history and roll back our progress this is yet another reminder that old battles have indeed become new again. Across this nation, extremists are attempting to silence the voices of black and minority voters. But we in Alabama have seen this before, and we are not going back without a fight. What we need is federal oversight. In September, I look forward to reintroducing the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act in the House of Representatives to restore the full protections of the Voting Rights Act, when, which Congress, which the Supreme Court gutted 10 years ago. I look forward to joining with my colleagues in the Congressional Black Caucus to demand that House Republicans bring this very critical legislation to the floor for a vote. In the words of John Lewis, the vote is precious. It's almost sacred. 
It is the most fundamental nonviolent tool in our democracy. John reminded us on the bridge in Selma, his last visit, that we must never give up, we must never give in, we must indeed keep our eyes on the prize. The CBC will never stop fighting for the equal right of all Americans to vote. It is with great honor that I introduce our colleague from Louisiana, Troy Carter. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Sewell. Thank you, Chairman Horsford. Thank you all for being here. The Supreme Court's recent decision to uphold the Voting Rights Act of 1965 aligns with the principles of a healthy democracy that values fair and equitable representation. I've advocated for a redistricting process in Louisiana that upholds fairness and protects the rights of black voters, including the creation of a second majority-minority congressional district in Louisiana. Over the past decade, Louisiana's population has grown, become more diverse, with black residents comprising roughly 33% of the vote. We have six congressional seats in Louisiana, yet we only have one African-American member of Congress. But one-third of six is two, which means we have an opportunity to elect two African-American members. The numbers speak for themselves. Math is math. Reapportionment is done every 10 years. It accounts for the ebbs and flows of population shifts. When we lose, we've accepted it. And now the numbers have shifted in our favor. And it is only fair and legal and just. And we demand justice and we'll continue to fight for the second seat in Louisiana. It is imperative that we move beyond our troubled history and embrace fair maps that align with the data, the facts, the empirical information that is not subject to politics not subject to the whim of any individual. It's just the facts. It's just the math. When individuals are granted the right to vote, their voices are amplified and their concerns are brought to the forefront for political decision making. Protecting and expanding voter rights ensures that every citizen, regardless of race, gender, or background, has equal opportunity to have their voices heard in the direction they believe our nation should go. Together we can achieve this goal. Together we can demand that Louisiana, Alabama is properly represented per the numbers. And remember this, math is math. It is what it is. We will not retreat. We will not cower. We will not back away. And my friends, we will not quit. <coughs> I am honored to stand here to say that we will, in fact, achieve this long overdue goal and justice for black Louisiana voters in creating a second congressional seat. This is the time, this is the now, and we will stand firm. Now I am proud to introduce the esteemed member from Virginia Congressman Bobby Scott, who is the former House of Delegates, former Senator of Virginia, ranking member of the Committee of Education and Workforce, serves on the Powerful Budget Committee to give comments. Thank you, Representative Carter, for your very kind introduction. Mr. Chairman, other members of the caucus, uh, I'm Bobby Scott, and I'm going to say a little bit about uh, the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action. The uh, Supreme Court has long held that our nation has a compelling interest in fostering di racially diverse campuses. Holistic college admissions practices that narrowly tailor the use of race as one of many factors in evaluating prospective students are key to fostering such diversity in higher education. Such admissions policies not only support historically underserved students, Research confirms that diverse campuses also provide all students with a quality, well-rounded education. 
Last month, the Supreme Court decided, with little regard for its own precedents or real, wor real world repercussions, that Harvard and University of North Carolina's pursuit of these compelling interests are unconstitutional. Regrettably, the Supreme Court's decision is a significant setback in our effort to eliminate disparities in access to higher education and ensure diverse learning environments for all students. It is now imperative that we, review, that we review other factors in college admissions that research shows are racially discriminatory, have a racially disparate impact, and determine if they too need to be eliminated. Race conscious admissions policies under affirmative action provided a counterbalance uh, to these factors uh, that have that adverse uh, disparate impact on students of color and students from poorer school districts. Factors such as inequitable K through 12 schools, racially biased admissions tests, and developmental and legacy admissions. These discriminatory factors have been somewhat overlooked in the past because affirmative action has balanced things out. But now, without affirmative action, these discriminatory factors cannot be tolerated. That's why the Congressional Black Caucus has encouraged the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights and the Attorney General to open Title VI civil rights investigations into whether Harvard discriminates on the basis of race by using donor and legacy preferences in its undergraduate admissions process. But it's time that we look into other types of practices in all schools. And we can, uh, in the case, uh, uh, has to be brought by the federal government because uh, of a Supreme Court case about 20 years ago, there's no private action under Title VI. And that's why we're also championing the Equity and Inclusion Enforcement Act, which among other things restores the private right of action for students and parents to bring disparate impact cases under Title VI. Students and parents deserve nothing less than the right to hold schools and federally funded programs accountable for providing all students with equal access to a quality education. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn the mic over to the gentleman from Maryland who comes to us with a distinguished legal career, Representative Glenn Abbey. Thank you, Congressman Scott. Um, this is a follow-up uh, to the affirmative action ruling that uh, the Congressman just discussed in the Harvard and UNC cases. There's been an impact that's already starting to spill over into government procurement issues and into the corporate uh, world of, uh, of America. The Ultima Services Corporation decision that came out last week actually struck down the 8A program in its entirety. And for those of you that don't know, the 8A program is, it was set up many years ago in an effort to help minorities, especially African Americans, but not solely, have a chance to compete for federal contracts. And the logic there is the federal government does trillions of dollars of contracting every year, uh, and it's important to help businesses grow to have a fair and equal chance to compete for those dollars. But we know that uh, historically we didn't have those opportunities to compete for the contracts. We didn't have those opportunities to get the capital. We didn't have those opportunities to get the credit that is needed to build and grow businesses so they can provide these sorts of services to the government. As we also know, the government has been, the federal government has been a source of, of growth for some of the largest businesses in America, especially in the defense sector, but across the board. So the 8A program and other programs within the SBA are critical to making sure that, that minority business in, in the African American community and beyond continues to have the opportunity to grow. Uh, and so we have to work hard to make sure that that opportunity continues. And the opportunity now is, is especially important because this is the time when the Biden administration has been pushing out uh, really billions and trillions of dollars in, in federal contracting that are going, going to go into communities over the next few years. And it's important to have minority businesses involved for several reasons. One, traditionally minority businesses have a record of hiring more minorities than non-minority businesses do. So that's important to give uh, minorities the opportunity to get into these these types of careers and compete uh, and some in some instances create their own businesses but also they provide services oftentimes in communities that minor majority businesses aren't aren't servicing so we need to make sure we we keep this going uh, so we're working hard right now as the CBC to push forward legislative strategies to respond to this 
We're going to continue to work with the laws that are still in place uh, under Title VI, as the Congressman mentioned, and others, uh, to make sure that we continue to work for it, make sure that those contracts have a chance to come out and the minority businesses have, to have the chance to com uh, compete for them. In addition, we're asking the administration to create records uh, that can be used to, to uh, sustain these programs. So the ultimate court said that basically it was striking down the 8A program because there was no showing in recent times of ongoing racial discrimination that justified these programs. Well, as Justice Jackson put so, so eloquently pointed out, Racial discrimination isn't an, a historical fact. It's a daily occurrence here in the United States. And that's clearly true in the economy, where it counts the most because, you know, follow the money. We know that's where this, is, this needs to happen. So we're going to work hard here at the federal level with the Biden administration to make sure that these records are developed and we can push legislation forward uh, to make sure that there's fair award in these contracts. And we're also going to reach out at the state level, too. I've already begun reaching out to some of the attorney generals uh, and, and states across the country to make sure that those programs, some of which are patterned after the federal program, have a chance to continue as well. Uh, so we're going to continue that work, uh, and I look forward to uh, continuing to work with the CBC to get that done in the Biden administration. And with that, I will pass the mic to Congressman Max Frost. Thank you so much. Good morning, and thank you to Chairman Horsford for gathering us here today. My name is Maxwell Alejandro Frost proudly representing Florida's 10th Congressional District here in Congress. And right now, Florida feels like the epicenter of the bigoted attacks against black communities and even black history because we have a far right governor and legislature that literally want to erase us. Erase us in schools, erase us in history, erase our books. It's the current history, it's the past history and what's, what we're doing here in the present. Last week, uh, Representative Horsford and my fellow Black Caucus members from Florida, Representatives Wilson and Sheriff Phyllis McCormick, sent a letter to the Florida Board of Education calling out their racist attempts to whitewash black history. In Florida, middle school children are now going to be expected to be taught that slavery could have been beneficial for enslaved people. Let me repeat that. Republican leaders in our state apparently want us to teach children that slavery wasn't that bad. The goal is to condition this generation to white supremacy because they see this generation is pushing against this far right wing fascist ideology. We want our freedoms. We want our people to be safe. And so seeing that as an existential threat to the Republican Party, they aim to change the way a generation thinks by changing what we teach them. But little do they know, not only will it not work, it'll piss us off and move young people to go and organize. Just look at the other attacks on black history in the state of Florida. Look at the book banning. You know what books they're banning? The, uh, like the biography of Rosa Parks. They're banning Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb. And I have to be honest, it angers me. And when I get angry, especially recently uh, with the president dedicating the National Monument to Emmett Till, I think about Emmett Till. When I feel hatred in my heart, sometimes I think about what Mamie Till went through. And I think about the fact that at that funeral, where her murdered, bludgeoned son was in an open casket, the press ran up to her while she was next to the casket, said, Mamie, Mamie, say something, say something. She wiped her tears and she said, I don't have a minute to hate. I will fight for justice for the rest of my life. In that tradition, we asked the Department of Justice and the Department of Education to use every tool at their disposal to look at what's going on in Florida because it's not just about Florida. It's about the history and it's about the future of this entire country. And I'm proud to stand with the Congressional Black Caucus as we fight for every single American and every kind of history because black history is American history. And with that, I pass it to my good friend from South Florida, um, Congresswoman uh, Sheila Shepherd from McCormick. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much to our Chairman Horsford for allowing us to expand on what's going on in Florida. I'm Congresswoman Sheila Shackles McCormick, and this week we were fortunate enough to stand with the Vice President and talk about what the state of Florida is actually trying to do to our children. Make no mistake, slavery was a brutal institution that had systemic cruelty built into it, where we saw every day African families were subjected to murder, torture, and our young kids in the state of Florida were ripped and actually made to be gator bait. That's right, 
our babies were used as gator baits in the state of Florida. State of Florida is the state and home to some of the biggest atrocities to African Americans. We just celebrated or recognized Rosewood, where we had a mob of white people come and kill an entire village and force them out. We have to recognize what this did to our country. The evil stain of racism still lasts today because of an institution that went and kidnapped people from Africa, transported them to the United States, or trafficked them to the United States, and actually brutalized them, forcing them to, forcing them to work, and treating them inhumane. For the governor to look at it and say this is a robust policy. What is strong and healthy about this policy? What is strong and healthy about actually trying to justify slavery? When we look at our history, it's not that we went through something evil or we've never done it, we've been perfect. It's that we've overcame, that we can stand here as the CBC, 58 strong, having that history. We must teach our children the truth. Middle schoolers from the age 11 to 13 will now hear rhetoric that tells them that slavery somehow was justified. What kind of person, what kind of person would embrace evil and teach it to our children? What kind of person will force it upon teachers to do the same? Well, that person is Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, who is trying to spread this throughout the United States. And I'm proud that the CBC is standing against it, that we're actually fighting back, and we're asking every parent to fight back against this. We cannot allow our generations to go forward believing that there was some kind of justification for cruelty and brutality. We cannot allow our history to be erased of how we've overcame and now we serve and lead the same country that enslaved us. We cannot allow us to be marginalized. Our strength is in our story. Our pride is in our story. Not as just black Americans, but as Americans. And that's why it's imperative that we stand up and say we will not tolerate this. That's why it's imperative that we talk about the atrocities, such as in Rosewood. It's important that we talk about how we've come this far. And so as we move forward, we want to make sure that we take a stand, not just against the ill-informed who are trying to teach our children, but the books they're banning, and every white supremacist who thinks they're going to take over the state of Florida. They will not take over the state of Florida, and they will not take over our country. With that, I'd like to introduce Representative Nakima Williams from the state of Georgia. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Congresswoman Akima Williams, and y'all, I proudly represent Georgia's 5th Congressional District, but I'm also proud to stand here today as the member of the Congressional Black Caucus with my co-conspirators for justice, always ready to fight for jobs, housing, and justice. When talking about the state of our democracy, we must address the current landscape for reproductive freedom in our country. Just over a year ago, an extremist Supreme Court overturned 50 years of precedent and federal protections for abortion. While the fallout from the Dobbs decisions has been disastrous for people across the entire country, it's being felt even more so in my home state of Georgia. Just one year ago, Georgia Republicans rushed to pass the harshest, cruelest, most sweeping abortion ban in the country. Since this abortion ban took place, the number of safe abortions has been cut in half. That doesn't mean abortions have been cut in half, just the number of safe abortions. Experts are sounding the alarm bells that this ban will only exasperate the black maternal mortality crisis in Georgia. And y'all, that's terrifying, considering that Georgia already ranks a distant 50th in the country for black maternal mortality. That means that more black women die within one year of childbirth in the state of Georgia than they do in developing countries. Polls show us that a majority of Georgians, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, y'all, they don't agree with the extreme Republican abortion ban, but Republicans turn their twisted dreams into reality with the support of a gerrymandered state legislature. Our reproductive freedom was curtailed because of people's voices being silenced at the ballot box. As co-chair of both the Congressional Voting Rights Caucus and the Task Force for Strengthening Democracy, and having served on the front lines defending reproductive freedoms across the South for over a decade as a Planned Parenthood staff member, I fully understand that my fight for reproductive freedom is dependent upon free and fair access to the ballot. We have an obligation as the Congressional Black Caucus to keep fighting because without voting rights, everything is on the line. Now is reproductive freedom, but without a government that is truly of and by the people that includes all the people, 
everything is on the line and this won't be the last time that we're standing here fighting for the same freedoms that generations before us have already fought. But y'all, we have a way to stop that. Last week, along with my colleagues, we reintroduced the Freedom to Vote Act. This is one of the strongest pro-democracy bills that we've ever seen. And it's the response that we need to counter the coordinated, intense efforts across the country to roll back the most basic foundations of a free society, the sacred right to vote. And we know that black and brown voters will suffer the most if we keep going with the failed status quo. And that's why all of us here today are committed to pre protecting your voting rights across the country. But y'all, it's not just the Freedom to Vote Act. Congresswoman Sewell mentioned her reintroduction of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. All of these bills together will protect our freedoms, our democracy, and ensure free and fair access to the ballot box for everyone, no matter your zip code, no matter your bank account. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus, Representative Stephen Horsford. Thank you. Governor DeSantis and the Florida Board of Education created these standards and they want us to believe that for hundreds of years, as generations lived entirely under slavery and as families were torn apart to benefit the landowners as needed, and as people were beaten, whipped, and killed because they looked at a white person the wrong way or tried to learn how to read, that they were learning a skill for their own benefit. I hope the governor and others who agree with him read the recent Washington Post article entitled, Enslaved Africans Were Already Skilled. Let me be clear. Black people did not benefit from slavery. We built this country. Our literal blood, sweat, and tears were squeezed out of our souls to build roads and bridges, construct beautiful mansions and government buildings, including this very capital and the White House. And in the end, what did the black families have to show for it? We did not have equity in the buildings we built. Farmers were made rich by the free labor that was provided. And then the start of the second class citizenship and segregation began to take root, denying us access to jobs, education, housing, health care, and so much more. And when slavery ended, some of our communities began to see success. And we even had several black men get elected to this very body we serve in now, both in the House and in the Senate. What happened? Jim Crow and the KKK were born. When our mere success threatened white men, they fought back in ways we couldn't imagine. And the act of lynching was born, which only recently under President Biden became a federal crime, thanks to the leadership of the CBC and our former colleague, Representative Bobby Rush. These are the things we must teach in our history. This is the real story of black America. This is the reality we have had to endure. Now we have members who are here with us and in this caucus who have lost loved ones to gun violence, myself included. And we all know many people who have faced discrimination and hate in various forms. We want our children and the next generation to live in an America where they can learn about their history, freely exercise their right to vote, go to a college they merit, and have access to wealth and opportunity, like everyone else in this country. Because we understand that when you lift up black people and black America, you lift up everybody. But let me be clear, stop gaslighting us, saying we are racist simply because we are asking for an opportunity to succeed. Stop saying white nationalists are not racist. They are. They are white supremacists. Moms for Liberty, Proud Boys, MAGA extremists, you are fighting to erase and censor our history, our truth. And we are here today to say, we see what you are doing, and we will not let it stand. Today, the Congressional Black Caucus is issuing our list of actions that we wanna see from Governor DeSantis to our Republican legislators in Alabama and Louisiana, to Senator Dick Durbin and Senate Democrats, and from so many others. 
And for black America, we want to hear your truth. Join the conversation on social media and tag at the Black Caucus with hashtag Black America. And tell us how these actions are affecting you. We will not allow this ban on black to endure. Now I asked my colleague, what is he so afraid of? And while others may be afraid, I'm turning to 2 Timothy that tells us, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And that is why the work of the Congressional Black Caucus as the conscience of the Congress is so important in this moment. We will not be silenced and we will not go back. I'll take questions. Thank you, Chairman. Ashley Banks with the GRIO. So you've laid out steps that the CBC is taking to advocate for black Americans. However, I want to get your thoughts on having to work alongside Republican colleagues who say things that negatively impact black Americans, like you've said repeatedly, uh, Representative Eli Crane called black service members colored. Then you have Senator Tommy Tuberville double down on his thoughts that white nationalists are racist. Or not racist, yes. Look, this is our work environment too. Our members, our staff, our constituents that come here, this is the place we work on behalf of the people. And in 2023, to have a member of Congress on the House floor refer to service members, veterans, and their families in such a derogatory way, the history uh, of, that, of what that word means, and to have a senator uphold white nationalists and not condemning them and not having others condemn it is why they need diversity training. They're proving every single day why diversity, equity, and inclusion is needed. And I would encourage them to contact the Office of Diversity here at the U.S. Capitol and benefit from the training and the resources that they have available. Thank you. Thank you. So I know, I know he's not a member of the Black Caucus, but I was wondering if you had any response to how the DeSantis campaign uh, criticized Byron Donalds for calling out the education curriculum in Florida. I, I, I saw uh, Representative uh, Donald's uh, response. Um, he's a constituent, he's a representative from the state. Um, he has served in the Florida legislature. Um, while I do not agree with a lot of his positions or his votes um, on this issue in calling out the governor and the Board of Education for standards that would in any way uh, indicate that slavery was a benefit uh, should be condoned. Uh, and we ask everyone, this is, not a, this is not a black issue. Everyone should be able to agree uh, that slavery had no benefit. Congressman Chan Daniels with The Hill. Wondering how you feel, particularly when we're looking at some of the, the leaders, uh, uh, obviously um, McCarthy, what you want to see from leaders of the Republican Party as this rhetoric, again, colored people being used on the House floor, um, some of the policies that are being put forth by potential presidential candidates. How do you want to see them respond and show um, maybe allyship is a little bit far, but you know, support for the CBC and black constituents at this time? Yeah, I'll, I'll defer to others. I don't expect much of them. This is about the people and what they should demand of their democracy. That is why the Congressional Black Caucus has had a summer of action where we have been going to the people through our Democracy for the People town halls and, and uh, youth forums and organizing because we understand that when the people demand more from their democracy, when we can hold our schools and our courts uh, and uh, the institution of voting accountable, that is when we will see the change we need. <clears throat> uh, Speaker McCarthy uh, continues um, to concede to the very extreme factions of his party. They're about to bring uh, appropriations bills to the floor that fundamentally cut uh, uh, support for families across the board, um, not only black families, but uh, all families and it shows that their priorities are more aligned with special interests 
and extremists than they are with the American people. And, and quite frankly, we expect from our leaders to be honest and to be forthright. And right is right and wrong is wrong. And so when you hear something as egregious and as so patently wrong, you would expect Republicans, Democrats, and others to stand up and denounce such lunacy. But their silence, their silence is deafening. You expect your leaders to stand up and to tell the truth. And when they find things that are wrong, regardless of which party it comes from, to stand up, as we would. As members of the Congressional Black Caucus, we will not condone bad act actions. We will not condone the erasing of history. African Americans in slavery today, Holocaust, and our friends in the Jewish community tomorrow. Where will it stop? And I call out for all people to stand up against this, not just black people, but everyone. Because today, slavery and African Americans, tomorrow, perhaps you. And so you ask what we expect from Kevin McCarthy and other leaders, particularly those who would attempt to ascend to the highest office of the land, stand up, stand against bigotry, stand against racism, stand against hate, stand against xenophobia, stand up for what's right, not for what's politically expedient. Representative Sheila Jackson Lee and then Maxwell Frost. We'll take one final question up here. Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much, and to my colleagues that have been gathered here who gave a uh, particularly unique educational journey uh, through their words as to where we are today. Uh, I'm very proud to say that we will hold a democracy uh, session in Houston, Texas uh, in a day uh, where we will be in the South and we'll talk uh, directly about a democracy uh, and then uh, immediately leave to the north uh, and be in Boston to discuss democracy. Houston is one of the most diverse cities uh, in the nation. And I think the lesson today should be very clear. America is an experiment. The world watches. And there are those of us who came unwillingly uh, in bondage, unlike any other group that came to this country. But the idea uh, that our history would be scissored, would be shredded, uh, is a crisis for the American experiment. It is to say to the world that we're not the America that they rush to come to, which is that the Statue of Liberty rushes them here, we came in a different way, that we're a place where everybody is affirmed. And I think the chairman has made a point, don't call us divisive. We are unifying. What we're saying is we want everyone at the seat of empowerment. And would you destroy the history of the Irish, the Italian, um, the, the, the heinous tragedy of the Holocaust, the indigenous Native Americans? Would you shred their history? And so the question is, what kind of children, unifying children, children that sit across from each other with different pigmentation and look gracefully, gratefully and gracefully of how wonderful it is to be an American? And so in this instance, I think that this cannot stand. Uh, the White House must go even further. And many of you know, I'm carrying H.R. 40. We can do a commission to study slavery under the umbrella of educating people about the journey of what slavery is and its uh, vitality, as I heard uh, uh, our members say. We built this nation. But the building was the own initiative and resilience. It wasn't we benefited. We could have come regularly and built massive things because we were already where we were doing genius type uh, engagement. So to distract truth uh, is a soiling of who America is. I call on the unity of America and I call on my colleagues. I will not let them go by. There needs to be leadership on the floor of the House and the Senate denouncing the actions of members <coughs> that would take away the vitality of diversity, inclusiveness, and equity, and that would in essence uh, shred the truth of our history, 
unity comes from knowledge. And we will stand on knowledge and the Congressional Black Caucus is a beacon of light and a tool and an example of the greatest of democracy because we don't work in isolation, we work in partnership. That's what this nation should be about. Uh, and I do believe it is time for a commission that studies slavery and joins with all the others in rejecting interpretations uh, about uh, this matter. I will just leave the podium by saying, in a story last night about a returning veteran after World War II who was going from Georgia to South Carolina, attacked uh, by uh, uh, white persons, black veteran after World War II, and eyes made blind because of the hatefulness, even as a returning veteran. And out of that came the movement of President Truman to integrate the military. It was on the backs of someone who had felt the brunt of racism. Are we not ready to move beyond that? Are we not ready for our children to be able to affirm that diversity? I think we are. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership. Um, my, my colleagues from, from as wide as Georgia and Florida and, uh, and Louisiana and, um, uh, and uh, Virginia and, and beyond Chicago and others, we come together. We're unified and we reach to America. Be unified. Uh, let us respect us as African Americans have always respect diversity of anyone else. Nicholas, did you have, did you have, I'm gonna come here, uh, Maxwell, I'm gonna have him uh, speak and then we'll come to your question. These last two. Yeah, the I'll just say briefly, you know, what should we expect from our leaders in this moment? We should expect members of either party to completely denounce racism and bigotry in this country, where we see it, even when it comes from members of their own party. What we get isn't that. What we get is a deep hypocrisy. These are members that will go on the House floor, vote yes on a resolution condemning anti-Semitism, and then not say anything about the Nazis that are walking down the streets of Central Florida every week, holding signs that say DeSantis 2024, and harassing children at synagogues. These are the same people that will host a round table with black business owners in their district. Then the next day, not say anything about their people in their own party saying racist remarks, calling us colored people. That wasn't no slip of the tongue. I promise you he uses that language at home. So I can tell you this, we have to call it the hypocrisy because it's not just a hypocrisy of words. It's deeply rooted. It's a hypocrisy that will continue the oppression of black people of color and poor people um, and lead to the death of people in this country. In this country, that is not hyperbole; it is fact. <coughs> yeah, hi, Gary Fields from Associated Press. You made a reference there about uh, DOE and also Justice Department potentially looking at Florida. Has the caucus actually made an official request to those two departments? to actually examine some of the things that are going on in Florida yeah. with the Department of Education? We met with Secretary Cardona yesterday. Uh, we have uh, issued formal letters uh, to uh, the Secretary as well as to the Attorney General. Um, we have uh, discussed with the White House um, the need to have a very aggressive uh, legal strategy to, one, uphold the law, which our colleagues uh, stated repeatedly. The, there is still law that needs to be uphold, upheld and enforced. Um, and to be clear what some of these decisions did not do, because there's a lot of misinformation. Tom Cotton went out and threatened big law firms over diversity, equity, and inclusion, even though the affirmative action case had nothing to do with that. He used his official resources to contact top law firms to convince them to back off of advising their clients on this issue. The Republican Attorney Generals issued a letter to corporate America stating similar demands. I'm proud that the Democratic Attorney Generals, led by my home state Attorney General, Aaron Ford, uh, responded and reinforced the importance of supporting efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's why we're also, as the Congressional Black Caucus, calling on corporate America to speak up and That's to right. reinforce their commitments. They made them after George Floyd, 
Are they no longer committed? Is it a business imperative only when it's comfortable? Are you really supportive of inclusion of your employees, of your suppliers, only when it's convenient? This is not convenient. It's not a convenient time for black people and for others who are seeing their rights eroded by an extreme court, by extremists here in the Congress, and now attacks at the local and state level. So yes, we have been in touch and will continue uh, to work with the administration. They, under they understand the importance of this, um, and we will work uh, with them in the weeks and months to come. Last question. Yes, thank you. Kirsten Gares of Cox Media Group. This is for the Chairman or even Congressman Frost. Um, you talk about trying to get the Department of Justice and Education involved. Even if they do, that would take time. What do you say to parents and teachers now who have to navigate this with different changes that they may not agree with and, again, may offend them as well? Yeah, th th thank you for the question because this is important and I, I've had the privilege of being a part of many different types of organizing um, from mutual aid to being arrested on the streets of Orlando and, and going to jail for simply uh, uh, participating in nonviolent protests um, to electoral organizing to organizing music festivals to bring people together. I say all that to say there is value in every kind of organizing. We have to organize here in DC and ensure that the institutions where we have power are doing everything they can to protect people in the state of Florida and across the country. But that's not where we stop. Uh, myself, we are organizing with groups on the ground in Central Florida. We haven't stopped knocking doors, right? We haven't stopped communicating with our voters at all. Um, we have 12 or 11 organizers working every day in Central Florida talking to parents right now and connecting them with resources they can use. And there's amazing organizations across the whole state of Florida that are working at telling parents what their actual rights are um, and what they can do to protect their children, to protect the education of their children. And so it's a long haul and there's a lot of work to do. But there are resources right now that we're connecting families with at the same time. Uh, we work with the, with the administration to ensure that they're using every resource necessary um, and available to them to protect people in Florida. And again, it's not just about Florida. This is about the entire country. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.